Hello, everybody. Welcome to Explore a Classroom. My name is Jennifer Bergen, and I am so glad that you have decided to join us today for our last episode of 2022. You know, this month has so many holidays coming up. Winter solstice, Hanukkah, Christmas, Kwanzaa, and so many more. We know that our viewers from all over the world are cherishing their cultural and family traditions this month. So we wish all of you from National Geographic a beautiful season of light and love. At National Geographic, we use the power of science, exploration, education, and storytelling to illuminate and protect the wonder of our world. And Explore Classroom connects students from around the globe with our National Geographic Explorers for a short lesson in time for your questions. And this month, we are organized around a theme. We are exploring the importance of learning from the past. And with that in mind, our explorer today is Dr. Lisa Briggs. Lisa is an underwater archeologist. This means that she studies items from the past and she helps recover these items from sunken ships. They are so deep in the ocean that she requires special training and scuba diving gear so that she can go down and get them. And her work has taken her all over the world. But today she's gonna to share about one of her most memorable ship visits because it belonged to a pirate. She's gonna tell you more today, including why she thinks it's so important to talk to young explorers like you and how she wants to inspire them to do roles like she does in STEM. So before we get into today's lesson, I'd like to welcome our registered viewers from all over the world. Hello to Laurel Wood Elementary, Holy Trinity School, Bennett Elementary, Santana Arts Academy, Friendly Hills Elementary, Wonderland Avenue Elementary, and of course, all of our homeschool families out there. We're so thrilled to have you. And with that, let's turn it over to Lisa. It is time for her to share all about sunken pirate ships. Take it away, Lisa. Thank you so much, Jennifer. I will share with you guys a fun story about pirates today. So first, let me now tell you about my work with the Blackbeard pirate and his lost ship, the Queen Anne's Revenge. So first of all, how do we know about pirates? A lot of times we read about pirates in what we call contemporary records, which means those were records written at the same time that the pirate lived. There's a really, really great book you guys should try to get your teacher to read to you called Captain Charles Johnson, A General History of the Robberies and Murders of the Most Notorious Pirates. And this is how we know about the pirate Blackbeard. So I had read this book and was so excited to learn more about all these different pirates from the golden age of piracy. But in particular, my very favorite was a man named Blackbeard. Here you can see some pictures of him wearing two very silly hats. Blackbeard the pirate became very, very famous when he blockaded a harbor in South Carolina in a city called Charleston. Most of the time when pirates would blockade a harbor, they would demand things like gold and different money and all sorts of stuff from the city. But the time that Blackbeard the pirate blockaded Charleston Harbor, he only asked for one thing. He asked for a chest full of medicine. We still don't really know why, but we think it's because members of his pirate crew were very, very sick and he wanted to make them better. So while he had the entire city blockaded, all he wanted were things like medicine to help his crew. Here in this picture, you can see some medical equipment that I found on the boat, which shows us that not only did he get the chest of medicine, but it remained on the boat when the boat sank. The area that we excavate in is a place called North Carolina and the Outer Banks. I will tell you a little bit more about them because the Outer Banks are full of sand that shifts around from year to year, which is one of the reasons why the ship got covered up. We go out every year on a boat called the Shell Point. Here's a picture of our boat. You can see me standing right next to the crane wearing a really silly life preserver. 
We work on this barge every year in the beautiful waters of the Atlantic Ocean. This is a picture of what the Outer Banks actually look like. The Outer Banks are an incredible geological phenomenon where it's a really funny little spit of sand that runs all the way down the coast. You can see this little funny line there. That is all just made up of sand. And this sand shifts around constantly. So once Blackbeard was pulling his boat, the Queen Anne's Revenge, into this really funny area, he ran aground on a sand bar, which means there was a big bar of sand under the water that stopped his boat dead in the water. And he decided to leave it there, mostly for underwater archaeologists to find in the future. Here's what it actually looks like. And you can see the shipwreck site down at the very bottom. So these sands, they shift around every year. And every year when we go back to excavate the ship, we have to dig up even more sand that was deposited since we excavated it the year before. This is a map of the shipwreck and what it looks like when you go scuba dive down on it. You see all these big black long things? Those are cannons that were on the boat. Pirates loved having cannons to defend against other boats when they went to try and attack other ships and take all of their gold and silver and their treasure. Or in some cases, a chest of medicine. You can also see a couple really, really big anchors on this map, which were so exciting to find and excavate. This is what an old anchor looks like. You might have seen it on something like Popeye's arm or depictions of anchors in various cartoons. And that is exactly what anchors from this period of time actually look like when you find them underwater. But when you actually find them underwater, they really look more like this. When something like made of metal is in salt water, it gets covered with what we call concretions or incrustations. This is part of a fluke of an anchor in this image. Here, you can also see all of this really interesting marine life grows over top of the anchor itself. Can you guys see some of these uh, black spiky sea urchins? There's at least three or four or five that you can see in this picture. And this just goes to show how things look like when I actually dive down and find them underwater. Sometimes you'd hope that it looked just like a boat in something like The Little Mermaid, where it just looks like a wooden boat that's fallen on his side. But unfortunately, all of these cool critters grow over top of it, which makes it a little bit more difficult to identify exactly what we're looking at underwater. But good thing I've been doing this for a long time. So when I saw this, I knew that we were looking at a really old anchor. One thing I do encounter a lot on this site are sand tiger sharks. The coast of North Carolina is a breeding ground for sand tiger sharks. And they're not that scary. They do have really big teeth and they do swim around a lot and there are lots of them. But really, for the most part, they just leave the underwater archeologists alone. And when we get really excited and happy when we see them because sharks are very important for the world's oceans. So we're always really excited and really, really happy to see sharks in that kind of context. Here's another example of a little cannon that we found one of the years that I was working on the project. As you can see, it's covered in marine encrustations and concretions, but you can still see the cool outline and the shape of what the original cannon looked like before it went in the salt water and all of this funny crust grew over top of it. Here you can see me in my cool scuba diving gear with a really funny face mask that we call an AGA mask. But what I really wanna show you in this image is what it looks like when we actually find artifacts. You see that black basket that we're raising up? That basket is full of what we call concretions, which are these blobs of cool artifacts. But really when we find them, they're so covered in marine encrustations and they're so covered in concretion that we don't know what's inside. So once we find them, we have to take them away to a scientific laboratory where they can perform what we call conservation to get inside the concretion and determine exactly what is inside. Here is an example of an, a concretion that's been partially taken apart. So when we find it, it just looks like a big blob of bleh. And when we take it to the laboratories, we start peeling away the outer parts 
and then we can see what's inside of it. So in this one, we found a cannonball and we found two grenades all the way back from 1718 when the boat sank. So when you find this big blob of concretion on the seafloor and you don't know what's inside, it's almost like a present that you have to open <laughs> and determine what's really inside there. So it's really exciting going to see the work that people do in the scientific laboratories. That is also where I work now in the scientific laboratories. So both finding the artifacts and then uh, digging them up and then trying to understand what's inside of them. Here's another few things, fun things that we see. I know pirates always talk about rum and yo-ho-ho and a bottle of rum. On this boat, we found lots of really cool rum bottles. But back in the early 1700s, bottles looked really different. And this is an onion bottle. That's the kind of shape that pirates liked to drink out of. Another great thing we found on the boat that really helped us understand exactly what time period it was from was the ship's bell. Ships would always have a bell that they would ring when they were coming into harbor or to alert other boats to their presence. And this one had a date of 1705 written on it, which really helped us understand exactly when the boat might be from. Here's a picture of what it actually looks like on our research vessel, the Shell Point. We uh, suck up stuff from the sea underwater in what we call a dredge, which basically just works like an underwater vacuum cleaner. And then the underwater vacuum cleaner dumps all of this sediment out into the series of piles that we go through. And that's where we really find a lot of the artifacts. So we have these big long hoses that go down into the sea and then come up on the boat to look at the artifacts there. So see here's some of my buddies going through all of the cool seashells and bits of rock and things that you'll find that go through the dredge up onto the boat. And then that's where we find some of the coolest stuff that we find. So here is an example of the dredge outflow with so many musket balls that would go inside a musket that a pirate would have. Can you guys even count how many musket balls there are in this picture? There are so many. One day I found 1,664 musket balls in one day working on this pirate ship. That was a really fun day. Once we get all of this seafloor sediment and sand up out of underwater, we put it through a series of little sieves and strainers, a bit like you would use to strain something like pasta when you're making macaroni and cheese. But in our case, we're sieving out bits of sand and seafloor sediment so that we can find these cool artifacts. Here, there's some really, really, really tiny, tiny bullets called grape shot that went inside of other muskets or even other little cannons. Sometimes we also find things like wood. Here I am finding a little tiny piece of wood that was probably part of the wooden ship when it was originally under sail. But I know what everybody wants to know about when we think about pirates and the stuff we found. We find pirate gold only sometimes. The gold that we find on the Queen Anne's Revenge Blackbeard's ship is called gold dust. We've done some scientific analysis of this gold dust and what we discovered was this gold dust came from West Africa. It has a very different look to it than gold you would find in say California or Colorado. So when we find this gold, we get kind of excited <laughs> because if I'm totally honest, archaeologists hardly ever, ever find gold. So this is the only gold that I've ever found is little tiny, tiny bits of gold dust. One of my favorite things that we found was a navigational instrument that they would use to look at things like the stars and to see how far away other ships were. That way they could know exactly where they were in relationship to the land and where they were going in their navigation. But my one of my absolute favorite things was this little lead gaming piece that has a big X on it. Pirates would get bored when they were at sea, just like we get bored when we're on a big road trip or where we're going somewhere. And so they would sit down and they would play board games, just like you might do when you're with your family for the holidays. But my other favorite thing about this is that when we talk about pirates, people always say X marks the spot. But in this case, I actually found a gaming piece with a really big X on it, which I thought was really, really, really fun. 
we find lots of really, really cool artifacts that we can show you. But my absolute favorite was one time I found a part of a sword. Everybody likes to think about pirates and their gold and their pirate swords. So when I first found it, as you might imagine, it was covered in all of those encrustations and what we call concretion. So I didn't really know what it was when I found it. I thought it might be part of a sword, but we had to put it through the x-ray machine. We use the exact same kind of x-ray machine like you would use if you had a broken bone or if you wanted to get an x-ray at the hospital. And so this, when we put this through, we realized, wow, look what's inside of this. It's a really cool part of a sword. So then I looked at it once they had gone through conservation, and this is what we found. This is what it actually looked like when it came out of concretion. It was really, really, really cool, and I think it was the coolest thing I ever found. They even wrote up stuff in the newspaper about it, and they said, somebody might have found Blackbeard's sword. But I'll be honest, I'll show you how big it is, because when we think of swords, we think of something big like this, like this guy's holding a really big sword. But in reality, it was really, really, really small. <laughs> it was it was teeny, 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 tiny. So it was probably more like a dagger or something. I would say more like a dagger than a sword, but it was really fun and exciting to find. It was still pretty much the coolest thing I ever found. Um, so I just wanted to say at the very end, we do a lot of serious work and we do a lot of science, but we also try to be really silly on the boat. Here's my friend Franklin being really silly when we had a film crew come out. Um, and I suggested when my friend was going to have a baby and she had a really, really big tummy from being having a baby that we would have a competition to see who had the biggest belly. And so we had a belly competition between my friend who was going to have a baby and two guys on the crew. And it turned out that she did not have the biggest belly at all. So it's always fun to remember, even when we're doing serious science and we're doing serious archaeology, we try to be really silly on the boat and have lots of fun anyway. So I wanted to say thank you so much for listening to me today, and thank you to National Geographic, the Underwater Archaeology Branch of North Carolina, Nautilus Productions, and the North Carolina Maritime Museum for everything that they've done for me. And if you guys want to hear more about my adventures, you can follow me on Instagram or on Twitter or any other media at Lisa Archaeology. Thank you so much for listening today. Well, Lisa, I want to thank you for all of your expertise today and your joy and your knowledge. And thank you for such a great episode. Oh, thank you, Jennifer. It was so great to meet you guys. And um, keep, keep studying hard in school and asking lots and lots of questions. To all of our students, our teachers, our families, thank you for joining us today. And we hope you've had a wonderful year of Explorer Classroom. You know, this was our last episode for ages four through eight in 2022. And we hope that you have had some really great adventures with us. And if you missed them, they are on our YouTube playlist. But we've also got some really amazing adventures coming up in 2023. And it's because we know that connecting you with National Geographic Explorers will help inspire the next generation of exploration. So go ahead and register for our shows in January. You go to natgeoed.org backslash Explorer Classroom. Well, happy new year, everyone. Stay curious and keep exploring. Take care, bye.